This video discusses threats to internal validity in experiments. At the end of this video, you should be able to identify threats to the validity of a randomized experiment and test whether a treatment was likely to be random using one or more pre-treatment variables. So a, a previous video discussed uh, experiments and also external validity in experiments. And so now we're going to turn to uh, potential issues with internal validity in experiments. So recall the definition uh, of internal validity, which is the ability to draw conclusions about causal effects for the same population and setting. So you may recall from that video on experiments that a well-designed experiment should be capable of measuring the causal effect of a treatment as compared to a control, even if we don't include control variables in our regression. And so one thing you might wonder when we introduce the idea of internal validity is why we even need to be concerned about uh, internal validity issues for experiments uh, at all. It's often assumed that doing an experiment is an easy way to get an unbiased uh, estimate of the, the treatment effect, but there are actually many things that can go wrong along the way. So let's start with a list of those things that could go wrong. We'll go into more detail in each of these shortly. So four common problems in uh, experiments are failure to randomize, partial compliance, attrition, and the Hawthorne effect. So we will see that each of these will cause uh, a threat to the internal validity, meaning that if we have one of these present in an experiment, then we should be concerned that our regression analysis to measure the impact of a treatment may not give us the true causal effect of that treatment. So let's start with the first issue, failure to randomize. Uh, the, the title is uh, self-descriptive here, so in an ideal experiment, uh, we would have complete control over the randomization process, uh, but it may uh, be possible in some situations uh, that that randomization was not done correctly. So going back to the example in the previous video where we were trying to measure the effect of a vaccine, uh, ideally we would be randomly assigning the participants either to receive a vaccine or not receive the vaccine, uh, but suppose that uh, some well-meaning medical assistant um, helping uh, out with this trial uh, administered a vaccine to someone who was in the control group thinking that that would be a benefit to uh, that individual. Uh, so unfortunately, that would be a failure to randomize, and now the treatment group and the control group are no longer uh, randomly assigned. Uh, so if we suspect that there may have been a failure to uh, randomize, we uh, might wish to do a suggestive test uh, to determine whether we think there's a problem. So in this regression, uh, we are going to find some pretreatment characteristic, so something that was determined before the experiment started. Uh, for example, we could look at uh, the participant's age, and we're going to regress that on a dummy variable for treatment. So one, if the individual was treated, uh, received the vaccine, for example, zero if they did not. Uh, so uh, recall that treatment is supposed to be randomly assigned, and if that's true, then it should not be the case that this treatment could have any impact on the pretreatment characteristics, just by definition. And so we should not expect, for example, that uh, older individuals are more or less likely to receive the vaccine. And if that's the case, then we should find here that uh, beta 1 is approximately zero. So we could essentially conduct a test is beta 1 equal to 0 versus not equal to 0? Uh, if we fail to reject the null hypothesis that beta 1 is equal to 0, then that's uh, at least a promising sign that uh, randomization occurred correctly. If we did find uh, the, the estimated beta 1 is significantly different from 0, then that would be a hint that perhaps there was a failure to randomize. So a second problem is what's called partial compliance. Uh, so the, uh, in real-world experiments, we often are not able to force subjects to comply with the treatment. Uh, so for example, if um, suppose that a vaccine requires multiple doses at different times, uh, what if uh, someone in the treatment group doesn't show up for the second dose? Then they are effectively no longer uh, treated, even though we had uh, randomly assigned them to the treatment group. Um, it's also possible in some situations that control group individuals find a way to participate in the treatment. Perhaps there's some way for them to um, 
uh, get access to the treatment outside of the experiment. So one way that we can distinguish between um, uh, uh, the assignment of treatment versus the treatment that they, the uh, participants actually received is to define two different variables. So here we're going to define uh, z and x both as dummy variables. We say that z equals 1 if we randomly assigned a participant to treatment, z equals 0 if we randomly assign them to control. But we also say that x is equal to 1 if the participant actually receives treatment, and x equals 0 if the participant actually does not receive treatment. So if we had all this information, if we knew whether each individual was randomly assigned to treatment or not, and we knew whether they actually received treatment, then how should we estimate the treatment effect? So one thing we might think to do is to focus on the actual treatment effect x and regress the outcome uh, y, whatever that uh, relevant, say, medical outcome is, on this dummy variable for uh, uh, re actually receiving the treatment. Uh, the problem here is that uh, beta 1 hat, the estimated uh, treatment effect may be biased here uh, because x is not randomly assigned. Remember, we randomly assigned uh, z. Uh, we randomly assigned whether um, those participants were intended to get treatment, uh, but x is not randomly assigned because of uh, this partial compliance. So in general, uh, that beta 1 hat may be biased. Uh, when our independent variable is x, the actual but non-random treatment assignment. So one way around this is to measure what's called the intent to treat effect. Instead of regressing y on x, we're going to regress y on z. So recall that z is whether or not they were assigned to treatment. And so if you think about uh, what this estimated beta 1 means, so suppose we did that regression and got a beta 1 hat, uh, that beta 1 hat would tell us the effect of an individual being assigned to treatment on their, their outcome. Now, since z is randomly assigned, that should be an unbiased estimate. Um, however, it might not sound uh, like exactly what we were trying to do, uh, because we'd really like to know what is the effect of the treatment, but instead we're finding what is the effect of being assigned to treatment, regardless of whether they actually received it. Uh, one thing you might want to think about is um, how do you think that this intent to treat effect, this uh, estimated beta 1 in the second regression, uh, would compare to uh, the, the treatment effect that we're trying to get. Um, sometimes that other treatment effect is called the treatment effect on the treated. In other words, the effect of uh, receiving the treatment for those who actually complied. You might be able to reason through that because uh, not everyone who was assigned to treatment got the treatment. This intent to treat effect is generally going to be smaller in magnitude than that treatment effect on the treated. Uh, there are techniques uh, to scale up that intent to treat effect to get a, a better estimate of the treatment effect on the treated. Uh, we won't cover those here. Um, however, I think it's also worth noting that some researchers would argue that the intent to treat effect is actually more relevant. So in the real world, we also cannot force people to participate in a treatment such as a vaccine. So perhaps it's actually more informative to know the intent to treat effect. A third concern, third threat to internal validity is attrition. Uh, the basic idea of attrition, uh, of attrition is simple. Uh, that's that subjects leave the experiment before we can observe their outcomes. Uh, now, of course, if we don't observe their outcome, which we've been, de been denoting as y, then we are not able to include uh, their observations in any kind of analysis, and so effectively we have to drop them from the analysis. You may recall that this is a problem that we've seen before, namely selection bias. So now, even though we randomly assign individuals to treatment or control, um, and we've done our best to collect information on them, uh, we have now uh, ended up with uh, some of those in, uh, individuals, some of those observations no longer being in our sample, and so it's possible that the sample is not representative of the population. 
Uh, this might be a particular concern, for example, if we find that more participants in the control group left the experiment than participants in the treatment group, we'd have to start wondering, well, what is it about those people that left? And um, you know, are they different in, in some, uh, some other way that could end up biasing uh, our estimate? The final threat to internal validity is known as the Hawthorne effect. This is the idea that sometimes knowledge of the treatment status has uh, some effect on, in, on individuals uh, to include psychological effects uh, rather than just the treatment ex itself. So perhaps the, the best known example of this is the placebo effect. Uh, this is a very common concern in medicine. Uh, the idea that simply thinking that you are treated uh, could potentially affect uh, your outcomes. Um, often in medicine, uh, it, uh, there's a belief that it improves uh, outcomes. I know that the opposite could also be true. Um, suppose that a control group realizes that they're in the control group and they do something, they work harder, they take other measures to try to catch up to the treatment group. Uh, so this would be another example of a, a psychological uh, effect that um, uh, may mean that the experiment is uh, not telling us the, the true causal effect of the treatment. Uh, one solution, uh, whenever uh, feasible in, in a study, is to make experiments what's called double-blind. So the idea behind a double-blind experiment is that subjects are not aware of their treatment uh, or control status. So as an example, uh, in this vaccine, um, the, both the treatment and the control group uh, subjects would both get some sort of injection, uh, but the treatment group would get the actual vaccine and the control group would get um, something inert, perhaps a, just a saline uh, water solution that is known not to have any effect and yet their experience um, of participating is not different. So in other words, they, they do not know uh, whether or not they're getting treated. Uh, the double part of the double blind also means that any uh, researchers, for example, who are administering the vaccines or collecting data also would not know uh, the treatment status of those participants. Uh, only uh, the, the researchers who are analyzing the final data would be able to, to know that. Uh, in case you're curious, the Hawthorne effect is named after the Hawthorne plant where General Electric ran experiments uh, on worker productivity uh, by doing things such as adjusting the brightness of lighting, uh, although uh, a look at the, the data later on actually revealed no Hawthorne effect.